Amen. Well, I did not miss that thumbs up. So, praise God. People have commented that I do some funny things before we get started. I said, well, I can't help it when he starts the camera. I try, but I'm not always successful. So, amen. Good evening, church. I've got the, I've got the irresistible urge to try and slide the pulpit over this way. Poor sister is seriously outnumbered on that side. Uh, that's okay, though. She, that, that, that's the remnant right there. That's the remnant side. Uh, perhaps we'll have a few more people come in and hopefully balance things out a little bit. Uh, but if you've got your Bibles with you, please, uh, again, join me in Revelation chapter 8. And as you're turning there, uh, again, please feel free to continue uh, finding your way to that chapter. I'll open us up for the word of prayer. Father, we do thank you. Lord, such a, such a privilege today was privilege to have another day upon this earth, to walk with you, to fellowship with you, to serve you, to commune with you, Father, to be a light in a dark world, to be salt, to be a, a city upon a hill. But Father, regardless of today's activities, whether they were successful or failed, Lord, may we turn our attention upon you. Father, as we study your word, may we have hearts that can grasp the truths that we're to look at. Father, may we have minds to also grasp the truth. So, Father, we are dependent upon your spirit to be our teacher. We pray, Lord, that you grant us a correct response this evening to your word. And Father, may you receive the glory and all that we say, and all that we do. Lord, our desire tonight is to see your face, to hear your voice. And again, Lord, today has been a, a privilege, but tonight is also a privilege to be able to come together in fellowship. To be reminded that we're not alone, that there are other believers that's also walking the path, hand in hand with you, trusting you, dependent upon your grace. Father, this evening we're dependent upon you. We thank you for the untold privilege and blessing of being able to have access to your word and study it. So, Father, bring glory to your name this evening, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. So far in the, in the book of Revelation, I haven't been able really to stop thinking about all the amazing things that we've seen so far. Uh, just in the, the seven chapters that we studied, the, we, in chapter 2, had an amazing uh, encounter with the risen Christ as the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos uh, beheld the risen Lord. And then we were brought into the throne room in chapter 4 and chapter 5, and we saw just simply uh, amazing things there as well, the very throne of God. And... We saw the four living creatures, uh, amazing creatures, uh, exalted order of angels, and we saw many things around the throne, uh, rainbow and lightning and, and thunder, and we saw angels, and uh, we saw the six seals to be opened up, and we've seen war and famine and uh, meteors coming upon the earth, just simply amazing things, and and we're not even halfway through the book yet. And I got to thinking, not only have we seen amazing things, but we've also heard some interesting things as well. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but up to this point in the book of Revelation, there's, there's been quite a bit of noise. Uh, for example, when John heard Jesus speaking behind him, he said it was a, a voice like a trumpet, very loud and authoritative, clear, speaking to John, and then when we got into, when we got into the throne room, then we, we really began to hear a few things, and we heard worship uh, as the four living creatures around the throne, without ceasing, said, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come, and we see the angels worshiping God, myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands with a loud voice, the Bible says, 
worshiping God and the 24 elders singing the song of redemption, the song of the Lamb as they was worshiping the Lord. And as I mentioned a moment ago, around the throne there were thunders and, and lightnings and, and there's been noise in heaven up to this point. But when we come to chapter 8, verse 1, it says that the Lamb, Jesus, broke the seventh seal and there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Worship has temporarily ceased, at least worship in the sense of the singing. The four living creatures have become silent. The 24 elders, the angels, all of heaven at this moment has ceased in their proclamation of the greatness of God. All of heaven gets still at the reality of the destruction that is about to come. At the, the reality of the judgments of God that's about to be poured out upon the earth, there's silence. If you will, there's, there's the calm before the storm, silence before judgment. And the Old Testament speaks of this. In Psalm 76, 8 through 9, it says, You caused judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still when God arose to judgment. Loved ones, that is a fearful thought, God arising to judgment. And it's fitting that the psalmist said the earth feared and was still. I don't think there's really an accurate illustration that, that we can give to really capture the idea of Almighty God rising up, if you will, in judgment. What come to my mind, and parents will immediately recognize this, imagine, if you will, a couple rambunctious boys playing in the house, and they're getting a little wild, and dad is in his chair, and mom in the, in, in the room tells the boys, settle down, you're, you're making too much noise, you're going to break something, and being boys, they keep playing, and then they come into the living room, and they're Rough housing ends up knocking over something on a bookshelf or on a coffee table. And after they ignored mom one too many times, guys, what usually happens, dad goes to get up out of his chair and the boys get still and they get quiet. And they know that now they're in trouble because dad has gotten up. Like I said, I don't think there's an illustration that can really capture in our minds the picture of God coming in judgment. Zephaniah 1.7 also says, Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. Zechariah 2.13, Be silent, all mankind, before the Lord, for he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. Silence is a, is a fitting response, don't you think? Silence would be very fitting before an angry God. Silence would be very fitting before a God that is about to pour out his wrath upon sinners and those that have rejected his son, Jesus Christ. Now, we're still in heaven. John is still uh, recording for us things that he's seen in, in the throne room in heaven. We know that from verse 9. Last week, John said, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which... No one could count. And they was before the throne, before the Lamb, so we are still there. And John is about to see something amazing. And in verse 2, he sees seven angels who are standing before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Now, I found it interesting, uh, not necessarily inconsequential. The word stand in verse 2 is in the perfect tense, which indicates that these angels are usually in his presence. Perhaps they was created for this moment. Perhaps God created them for the very purpose of them being handed the seven trumpets and their, their job was to blow the seven trumpets. But there they were and they were ready and they was before God and they was given the seven trumpets in order to sound the trumpets of God, that is the seven judgments of God. Now remember, the seven trumpets and the seven bowls are part of what? The seventh seal. The seventh seal encompasses the seven trumpets and the seven 
bowls. And we just read where Jesus has just broke the seventh seal. But before they can sound their trumpet, they have to wait for another event to take place. And John tells us what that is in verses 3 through 6. First, verse 3 and 4, John says, Another angel came and stood at the altar, holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him, so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. Now, we've already seen this incense, or excuse me, this altar on one other occasion, and this would be the altar of incense. It's the heavenly counterpart to the one that was in the temple. And notice it says that this altar, excuse me, was made of gold. He came and he stood at the altar in this golden altar, and the one in the temple was also made of gold. And the censer that the angel was holding, it was a more of a saucer. It wasn't necessarily a bowl or a plate, uh, very similar to the traditional pies and offering plates that we've all seen so many, so many times. And that, that's what the uh, angel was holding. And it's a picture of, in the Old Testament, the priest twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening, they would take this censer, this uh, pan, this saucer, and they would go to the brazen altar where the sacrifices were made, and they would scoop some of the coals out from this altar, and then they would take it back to the holy place, to where the altar of incense were, and they would take incense, and they would use the coals to light the incense, and it was representative or symbolic, if you will, of the prayers of the saints rising up to God from the altar. And we have a picture of this with Zechariah in Luke chapter 1, in verses 8 through 10. It says, Now it happened that while he, that is Zechariah, was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Of course, that would have been upon the altar of incense. And the whole multitude of people were in prayer outside, at the hour of the incense offering. Now you may remember back in chapter 6, the first time we encountered this altar was the fifth seal. And when the fifth seal was broken, it showed the martyrs that was under the altar, as it were. And they were praying unto God, and their prayer was, um, in verses 9, 10, and 11, that they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And now we have a picture here of John in heaven, and there's the seven angels, and they're holding the seven trumpets after Jesus has broken the seventh seal. And this angel comes along, and he comes up to the altar of incense, and he uh, lights the incense and the prayers, and they're going up to God But then he does something that had to have taken John possibly by surprise, if not all of heaven by surprise. Because the prayer of the martyrs in chapter 6, verse 10 are about to be answered, and and watch how God answers them. In verse 5, it says, Then the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and threw it to the earth. That must, uh, that must have certainly caught John off guard because he understood the altar of incense, he understood the prayers of the saints going up to God, growing up Jewish, growing up very familiar with the temple. But now this angel takes some fire from the altar and he throws it down to the earth. And the word throw, uh, it's, it's not like uh, he would just kind of pitched it or tossed it or poured it out, the word has force behind it in the Greek. And it literally means to hurl it. Like a professional pitcher throwing a fastball. He's throwing it with force and with power down to the earth. And there's a firestorm that is going to hit the earth as a result of him casting this down upon the earth. And the prayers for vindication from the martyrs are about to be answered. 
And this is very, uh, very much a fulfillment in Deuteronomy 32, 35 through 36. God says, vengeance is mine and retribution. In due time their foot will slip, for the day of their calamity is near. And the impending things are hastening upon them, for the Lord will vindicate his people and will have compassion on his servants. And now look at the rest of verse 5, if you will. After the angel took the censer, filled it with fire of the altar, and hurled it to the earth, it says there followed peals of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. You may remember last week that the four angels at the beginning of chapter 7 was holding back the four winds of the earth. And they had a temporary restraint put, if you will, on, on the judgment that was about to come upon the earth. And in verse 3, another angel in verse 2 came out of the east and told those four, don't, don't harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their forehead. So this angel told them, don't release the judgments yet. Hold them back for a time. Hold, the, hold them back from coming because the earth, the sea, the trees, they're not going to be affected until the trumpet judgments, which is what we're looking at now. This restraint is over. And what we're going to see is the first four trumpets affect the ecosystem and the atmosphere of the world. And they're very quick and they're very devastating. Six verses, we have the first four trumpets blown. The last three trumpets are demonic spiritual activity that will affect men directly. Demons will literally be let loose upon the earth to harass men, attack men, kill men. And they last from chapter 9 to chapter 11. So the first four are devastating, but they're quick. And the last three are more devastating, and they're more uh, drawn out, if you will. So, verse 6 through 7. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound them. And in verse 7, the first sounded... And there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. Fire and blood. Again, we have another fulfillment of prophecy. Joel 2.30. God said, I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth. Blood, fire, and columns of smoke. From the earthquake in chapter 5, it stands to reason that this is going to cause all kind of volcanic eruptions around the world again, just like we studied on the last earthquake that hit. It's going to naturally cause volcanic eruptions, and there's going to be lava spewing into the air. There's going to be the steam, and it's going to become water, and there's going to be ash that is thrown into the air. It's going to pollute the air. It's going to mix with the rain. It's going to mix with the hail, and it certainly can appear like blood because this is what John is seeing when the first trumpet sounded there was hail and fire mixed with blood I want to remind you that the atmosphere right now is in absolute chaos you remember back in chapter 6 when the sixth seal was opened in verse 14 it says the sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up the atmosphere is in absolute chaos right now so this first trumpet sounds, and there's an earthquake from the angel throwing the censer, and this trumpet brings hail and fire, and it's mixed with blood, and there's volcanic eruptions that are taking place. There is pollution in the air, and the atmosphere is already in absolute chaos. And notice what happens to the earth. It says that a third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. One third loss of all of these things would be absolutely catastrophic to man upon the earth. There will be widespread fires all over the place because it says that the earth, the third of the trees, and the grass will be burned up. That'll mean destruction of crops, 
which is going to, of course, uh, affect the food distribution, which is already suffering from the famine uh, from the seals earlier, from the war. People are already struggling for food. There's already rationing taking place. Now there's going to be even more damage as crops are destroyed. There's going to be homes that are destroyed, businesses that are destroyed. There's going to be loss of animals, which would certainly mean a loss of livestock, which means a further blow to the food popul- to the food distribution of the world. There's going to be a loss of materials for construction. Loved ones, one third of the earth being burned up is going to be unbelievably damaging to man, to the ecosystem, to trade, to everything that we know. And then we'll see the first trumpet is going to be on land. The next two are going to be on sea. Notice the second trumpet in verse 8. The second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Now, again, John is saying something like, Something like in verse 8, he, he's doing his best to describe what it is he's seen. And what he sees is like a great mountain burning with fire. I believe what John is seeing here is going to be a massive meteor or a massive asteroid that, remember, the atmosphere is not what it used to be. Normally, meteors and asteroids, they burn up before they ever even reach the earth. Once they hit the atmosphere, they burn up and and you don't know about them. This one is going to make it through, and it's going to be absolutely monstrous. And when it hits the atmosphere and the gases around the meteor ignite, it's going to be a flaming mountain that comes down through the sky. And the whole world, think about this, loved ones, the whole world is going to see it. How long does it take for something to be recorded on a, on a cell phone these days and posted to Facebook, posted to YouTube? sent directly to news uh, outlets and news companies. The whole world is going to see this happen in one way or another. And I believe it stands to reason that perhaps uh, telescopes, NASA may even see it coming. It may be far out enough that they begin to see it and they begin to predict it. We can't guarantee that. That's more me talking than anything else. But the size of this thing, John referred to it as a mountain and notice what happens it's going to be burning with fire and it's going to be thrown into the sea and the bible says that a third of the sea will become blood now i find it interesting john didn't say that it will become like blood but he said it will become blood now it could be that there's going to be such an enormous amount of death of marine life that the death of the marine life is going to cause the ocean to literally be filled one-third of it with blood. Or it could be that God is going to do the same thing he did with Egypt, and he will supernaturally, in judgment upon the earth, cause it to become blood. But I believe in this particular case, we have every reason to believe that one-third of the sea is actually going to turn into blood, be it from death from the marine life, or God's supernatural intervention, that he causes it to be that. But also notice this. A third of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, which gives us further reason to believe that to be the cause of it turning into blood. And a third of the ships were destroyed. Now this, this is interesting detail, isn't it? What do you think happened when, the, when this massive meteor hit the ocean? Tsunami, right? a tsunami would have taken place. It would have, it would have been absolutely devastating, and one-third of the ships would have either been capsized, they would have been destroyed, ports would have been destroyed when the tsunami hit. It would have caused an economic disaster upon the earth. There would be no trade, there would be no ships to carry cargo from one land, no import, no exports. And loved ones, I couldn't help but think about some of the movies that we've seen where a giant meteor is threatening the earth. Armageddon was one of them that come to my mind with Bruce Willis. 
The other one that come to my mind was the one with Morgan Freeman, and I, I believe, if I remember right, it was Final Impact, or maybe it was Deep Impact, one of, one of those two. And uh, guys, you can judge me if you want, but that was the one that made me cry at the end. It was just absolutely heartbreaking. The meteor was coming, and it was massive, and it was going to be uh, an, an, an end times event, is what they called it. And the whole storyline involved a family and a young man. He was a teenager, and he had a girlfriend. And anyhow, the meteor is coming, and everybody's running for their life. And as you can imagine, all the roads are jammed up. And the boy had gotten the hold of his dirt bike, and he had gone and gotten his girlfriend, and now he was trying to get his parents to come with him, and being a good son, he was trying to save his family. And they took their youngest daughter, just an infant, and they gave him to him. And the dad looked at him and said, son, you got to go. Take your daughter, take your, take your sister with you. And the boy was refusing, and he was swearing that he could save all of them. And dad said, son, y'all can make it. We can. Go. And with tears, he gets on the bike and his girlfriend is on the back. She's holding the baby. He takes off. You see the meteor coming overhead. Mom and dad are expressing their love for one another. The meteor hits. You see the wave coming. The dad turns the mom's head away, embraces her. The wave hits. Judge me if you will, guys, but it was a beautiful moment. It got the better of me. But here's the thing. This is no movie. This is really going to happen. John sees a mountain, a meteor that was, the, that was so large, John described it as a mountain, coming into the ocean. And it's going to create absolute havoc over the earth. And it's going to destroy one-third of the ships and the ports where the ships were at. So one-third of the earth has been burned up. One-third of the sea has turned to blood. And one-third of the ships have been destroyed. And now we have the third trumpet in verse 10. It says, The third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. Now remember, the word star in the Greek in the book of Revelation, it can refer to any celestial body that is not the sun or the moon. It's not a literal star as we know the stars billions of miles away, uh, balls of gas burning. If, if it was a literal star, the earth would be incinerated uh, the second it got too close to it. Rather, I believe this is better to view as a comet. A comet is coming into the atmosphere and this one in some way disintegrates and it spreads all over the world, and it lands, the Bible tells us, upon a third of the rivers and the springs of water. That is, it's going to poison all of the fresh water. The springs of water, that would have been drinking water. That would have been the fresh water that was available to man. And in verse 11, it says, The name of this star is called Wormwood, and a third of the waters became Wormwood. Now, the, the Wormwood, I looked it up. I became curious why there was such a, a specific name for it. Apparently, Wormwood is a shrub where the leaves are used in, med, in the manufacturing of absinthe. And it is apparently a liquor that is so, to so toxic it's banned in many countries. Uh, it, it, it is just absolute poison. Uh, but some people actually try to make liquor out of it. And it, it's so bad that they just flat out banned it uh, in countries. We see it in the Old Testament used eight times, the word wormwood, eight times in the Old Testament. And it's always associated with bitterness, poison, and death. Three times it is used for poisonous water. Let me just give you one example. In Jeremiah 23:15, it says, Therefore, this is what the Lord of armies says concerning the prophets. Behold, I am going to feed them wormwood and make them drink poisonous water. For from the prophets of Jerusalem, ungodliness has spread into all the land. So here comes this, this comet after, the, after this great mountain has hit the, the ocean and after a third of the earth has been burned up. And notice it said it was burning like a torch in verse 10 when it came into the atmosphere and then it spread to all the fresh waters and in verse 11 the name of the star is called wormwood 
And it said, a third of the waters became wormwood, and many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. Many men died. How many of you know you can only live three days without water? Three days. And that's it. After, after that, you're, you're going to die. Now, it doesn't specifically say why they were drinking the water. Could have been they were drinking the water because they didn't know yet. They didn't know the waters were poison. I mean, imagine all the people in the world and all of the rivers and fresh water is poison. It's probably going to take a little bit of time before people figure out, don't drink the water. Uh, so it's very possible that just out of a lack of knowledge, they drank the water, and then they realized it was poison. It, it could also be, perhaps, it was desperation that led them to drink the water. Perhaps they thought if they boiled it, it would be safe because the ecosystem has taken such a hit, all of the fires... All of the things that are taking place around the earth right now, the, the ocean and the atmosphere, everything happening, it could have been that they were so desperate for something to drink that they decided to risk it, but instead ended up dying as a result of this incredible thirst that was on them. So what we've seen so far in these devastating judgments is the first trumpet dealt with the land. The second and third trumpet dealt with the ocean, the sea, if you will, and all of the fresh water, the rivers and the springs. And now the fourth trumpet is going to deal with the air, the atmosphere. Notice verse 12. The fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun and a third of the moon and a third of the stars were struck, so that a third of them would be darkened, and the day would not shine for a third of it, and the night in the same way. Interesting, the word struck in verse 12, it says uh, a third of the sun, third of the moon, third of the stars were struck. It, it's, uh, it's where we get the root word for plague. It's where we get the root word for plague in the Greek. They were literally struck with a plague, if you will. They were made sick, so to speak. And as a result of this partial eclipse, temperature is going to drop. How many of you remember the eclipse? from, uh, no, what was that, 2010? Or not, I'm sorry, not 2010, my goodness. Um, somebody help me with the math. 17? That's right, 2007, 2010, where am I at? 2017, thank you. Uh, how many of you remember it actually getting cooler when, when the sun, I, I remember that vividly sitting outside. I remember the crickets started chirping, the security lights, on, on houses came on because it got dark, but I remember the temperature took at least a 10, 15 degree drop immediately. So with this partial eclipse, you're going to have similar things like that happening. You're going to have the temperature that is going to change. And remember, this is already an atmosphere that's been devastated by the judgments of God. The change of the moon is going to affect the ocean's tides, which is going to create violent storms all over the earth, which is going to create more loss of life. And you may remember not too long ago we made the observation, crime doesn't take a holiday, right? Can you imagine how much worse the looting and the crime is going to be in extended darkness? People are going to take full advantage of the sun not shining, the moon not shining as they are used to it. And it says that a third of them would be darkened and the day would not shine for a third of it and the night in the same way. Crime is going to be absolutely rampant during this time to add to all of the other miseries that's already taken place. And this darkness again is prophesied in the Old Testament. Isaiah 13, 9 through 10. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger, to make the land a desolation, and he will exterminate its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. Loved ones, if this isn't a fulfillment of Isaiah 13, I simply don't know what is. And we also see in Ezekiel 32, 7 through 8, God says, and when I extinguish you, I will cover the heavens and darken their stars. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon will not give its light. All the shining lights in the heavens I will darken over you, 
and will set darkness on your land, declares the Lord God. Loved ones, this is, this is so, so heavy at times because we spend so much time, as we should, studying the mercy of God, the grace of God, the love of God, the kindness of God, the faithfulness of God. But how many of you know that one of the attributes of God is also he is holy and he is just? And he has said repeatedly he will judge sin. He will judge sinners. And even though they chose to ignore him, even though God is patient, not willing that any should perish, there does come a day where God's judgment is poured out. And we're seeing it now on an even greater scale than the first six seals. And loved ones, it's just going to get worse as the next three trumpets are blown and as the seven bowls are beginning to be poured out upon man. Now, verse 13. John says, Then I looked, and I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven, saying with a loud voice. Hold on, let's stop right there. <laughs> okay, this is one of those wonderful, wonderful parts of Revelation where, where it leaves, where it leaves the, the teacher uh, in, a, in a predicament. Do we try to figure this one out, or do we just sort of skim over it, keep on moving, and hope nobody asks you afterwards what that could possibly be? Well, I've never been one to shy away from a challenge. So uh, let's consider this. Now, on one hand, you have some commentators that say this is an angel. They say this is an angel flying around in uh, heaven. I have difficulty with that. Why would the Holy Spirit inspire John up to this point to consistently use angels in God's service, in the, the blowing of the trumpets and the announcements that they've made? Every time so far it's been an angel, God has said this was an angel. Furthermore, in chapter 14, verse 6, you don't have to turn there, but this is uh, right before the um, seven bowls are being poured out, and it says this. John says, I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God, give him the glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and sea and springs of water. Now in my mind, why would God make it very clear in Scripture that we have an angel flying in mid-heaven, but then in this one instance use an eagle? So I don't know if I can lean towards this as an angel. It seems just a little too easy for me uh, to just chalk that up as an angel and then sort of move on. What crossed my mind was if God can make a donkey speak and use him in his service, why could this not be a literal eagle? It doesn't seem that far-fetched, does it? God calls the donkey to speak, and uh, we all are okay with that, and we accept that. So I don't think it's too hard to believe that this may be a literal eagle flying in mid-heaven, saying with a loud voice, and by the way, I'll let you come to your own conclusion on this one. Uh, you, you can fall either on either side if you want to. I think in this particular case, the important thing isn't necessarily so much is it an eagle or is it an angel, but rather the message that's being given. And the message is this at the end of verse 13. Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Three woes, one for each remaining trumpet. And throughout Scripture, woe is always used as an expression of judgment and destruction. You may remember in Matthew 23 when Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees, his harshest uh, words to them in Scripture where he consistently said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Repeatedly, he said, woe to you. It's to speak judgment 
is to speak destruction upon the individual. And the eagle is saying, there are still three remaining blasts of the trumpet that are about to sound. These three are worse than the first four. And loved ones, what I see here is an opportunity for sinners to repent. I see an opportunity for those that are upon the earth that is hearing this eagle speak these words, that seeing the destruction all around them, it's an opportunity for them to lay down their pride and to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because as we continue through the book, we're going to continue to see God giving opportunity for sinners to repent. Isn't that good news? Even in the midst of judgment, we still see God's mercy. We still see God offering salvation to sinners. And now we have a warning of what's to come and an opportunity for them to repent. Incredibly gracious of God. Now, very quickly, we'll just read a few verses of chapter 9. And it's a fairly short message this evening. Verse 9, Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. He opened the bottomless pit, and smoke went up out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given to them, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing or any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it, scorpion, when it stings a man. And in those days men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die and death flees from them. I believe it's appropriate that the announcement at the end of chapter 8 is woe to those who dwell on the earth. That is, woe to those that are continuing to reject Jesus Christ, that are continuing to rebel against God. Now God is literally about to allow, and he is in sovereign control of the entire thing, and we'll see that as we study it. God is literally going to allow demons upon the earth to torment man. Loved ones, I, if I remember correctly, I told you from the very beginning, some of this book can get heavy. It can get heavy. But we need to study it. Because the better understanding we have of the book of Revelation, the better understanding we have of God. The better understanding we have of God, then the more we can grow to be like Christ. And the better understanding we have of the ending the greater opportunity we have to share the gospel with those that are lost. Let's pray. Father, take these words this evening, I pray, and use them for your glory. Father, help us meditate on the scripture that says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Father, we do thank you for your grace. That you called us, you saved us, you redeemed us. Lord, there's a lot of co-workers, a lot of family members, a lot of friends that don't know you. We want them to know you as the merciful, loving, gracious, kind Father that, that by your grace we have come to know. Father, otherwise they're going to come to know you as judge. So Lord, we ask you for the grace to share the gospel with them. We ask you for the grace that you... Grant them repentance. We ask you for the grace, Father, that they respond. And Lord, if there's any word we can speak to them, Father, put it in our mouth. Set us off to the side and may your Holy Spirit speak to us. Father, this book is real. It is not a movie. It is not allegory. It is not a figure of speech. It is literal. Father, there is coming a day where the pages that we're reading right now will be reality upon this earth. So, Father, help us, I pray, to save even just one from the fire for your glory. 
Not that we save them, but you save them. So, Father, use us as your instruments, I pray, to warn those that are lost that, yes, you are loving, but you are also holy. You are also a judge, and that day will come. So, Father, bring glory to your name, I pray. Take the words this evening and use them as we meditate upon them to transform us into the image of your Son. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.